Chapter two, we're going to study motion. We're gonna start by talking about the development of physics. So this is going to be the first chapter where we're really delving into the physics portion of the course. In ancient Greece, they observed the movements of the planets. The planets is actually the Greek words for wanderers. They noticed the orbiting of the planets. They noticed the stars changing places. This led to the study of motion of objects on the planet. This study was termed natural philosophy, so it wasn't yet known as physics. The scientist that we're going to focus on most in this chapter is Galileo. So Galileo had many accomplishments in life. He was the known as the father of observational astronomy because he first used a telescope in 1609. He also agreed with Copernicus that planets orbited the sun. So up until this point, most people believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and everything orbited around Earth. Copernicus was one of the first to try to disprove that belief, with Galileo right along beside him. Galileo was also known the father of modern science. This is due to his studies in speed, velocity, gravity, projectile motion, among other things. These are all topics that we're going to cover during our physics portion of the course. Galileo was also known as the father of the scientific method. Now this one you should recognize. So if you remember from chapter one, the scientific method was an organized approach to solving scientific problems. So Galileo was the first to come up with this idea of an organized approach. The scientific method transformed modern science. Scientists now had a organized approach a step-by-step -step way to approach problems. It was the process in which scientific hypotheses were formulated based off observations, where scientists could hypothesize and guess through their own understanding and experiences those observations, and then also test them through experimentation and measurements, and even verify them, leading to theories and scientific flaws. Just a reminder of the scientific method, if you forgot from last chapter, you start with an observation, which leads to a question, then you explain that question in a common sense way, forming a hypothesis. That hypothesis then leads to experimentation, which moves on to analysis of the data collected in those experiments. Then finally, if that experiment and data supports your hypothesis, it becomes a theory, if not, start over again. So let's look at scalar and vectors. We'll start by defining a scalar quantity. So a scalar quantity only has a magnitude. So magnitude meaning a numerical value associated with it. An example of this listed below would be time, for instance. So time has a number associated with it. For instance, it's 2.30 p.m., but it doesn't have a direction. Time moves forward, but it doesn't move north, east, south, west, right, or left. Length as well as a scalar quantity. For instance, if you were measuring a pencil with a ruler, you would say that pencil is 5.2 inches. So you'd have a number, a magnitude, and units associated with it, but you don't have a direction. You wouldn't say that pencil is 5.2 inches north. So what is a vector quantity then? Well, a vector quantity has both magnitude, so a number associated with it, as well as a direction. So an example of a vector quantity would be velocity. So say you're driving in a car and you look at your speedometer, you're going 60 miles per hour. Well, the speed that you are going, the speed that you're reading off of the speedometer is a scalar quantity because that is just a number, 60 miles per hour with units associated with it. However, velocity, what we're talking about in this course, is a speed with the direction also. So if you were going 60 miles per hour southwest, that would be a velocity, a vector quantity, because you have the magnitude and the direction with it. Some other examples are below. We'll talk about force, momentum, and some other vector quantities in later chapters.
what we're going to look at are some word problems. So that's mainly what this chapter is about. We're going to get a list of equations dealing with velocity, acceleration, distance, and time. And we're going to use a systematic method to go through these word problems and solve them. So steps for solving word problems, which requires metric units. So we're going to start by reading the problem. Okay. Now, the equations that we're going to be introducing, we need to have metric units in order to solve them. Remember, metric was part of the SI system. It was this international system of units that was agreed upon between the science and mathematical fields. So when we are using these equations, since we are dealing with physics, a science, we need to make sure that our units are in metric before inserting those values into the equation. So once you read the problem, you want to pick out the numbers and units in the word problem and convert any values to metric if necessary. So that's going to be our first step. We're then going to make sure we are assigning proper symbols to each known quantity. What this means is we're going to assign a variable for each number involved in the word problem. So we would say d equals 2, and then we would put whatever the distance was in the word problem. Or t equals 2, and we'd insert whatever the time was in the word problem. We are also going to write what the unknown is and put a question mark by it. This is going to help us keep track of all of the information given to us in the word problem and pick the appropriate equation. Because that's what our next step is, to select an equation that contains those specific symbols that we wrote down in step two. That way, we can place the values in the equations and solve. We're going to make sure we're using our significant figures and, of course, labeling units where necessary. So let's look at the equations that we're going to be using this chapter. So off to the left here, I have different quantities and symbols, so the variables representing these quantities. So whenever we see a distance, we are going to label that with the variable d. When we use distance in any of these equations, we need to make sure that the units are in meters. The next quantity we're going to look at is speed or velocity. Now I know I said speed was a scalar quantity and velocity was a vector quantity. Sometimes they are used interchangeably. Most of our problems will say the word velocity and we will represent velocity with the variable v. When we use any values in for that variable, we want the units in velocity to be meters per second. So we don't want miles per hour, we don't want kilometers per hour, we want meters per second. So we will need to convert if necessary. Another variable we'll see is for average velocity. Since it's a velocity, we're also representing it with the letter v, but we have a sub av after it. Since it's still a velocity, we're still going to have the same units, meters per second. Yet another variable we'll, variable we'll see is a, and that's for acceleration. When we're talking about acceleration, the units on that are going to be meters per second squared. Acceleration being the rate at which something speeds up or slows down. Time is another one. The variable representing time will be t, and the units will need to be in seconds. So now let's look at the equations. So you'll notice the equations are just a combination of all of those symbols that we just discussed. We have two different types of equations. So it's important when we're reading these word problems to figure out what type of word problem it is. Is it a zero initial velocity word problem, like these equations to the left? Or is it a non-zero initial velocity problem? So to figure that out, if the object is initially at rest, so not moving, so a parked car or a soccer ball sitting in a field or a box just sitting on the ground not moving, that's going to be a zero initial velocity problem. And that means that we are going to pick from the following equations shown. This is going to help narrow down our equations. 
For non-zero initial velocity, these will be objects that are at rest from the start. What that means is if the car is already in motion and then it starts to speed up or slow down, or if the ball is already in motion, so on and so forth. If it's a non-zero velocity, initial velocity problem, we'll be using this set of equations. Notice they are very similar to each other. So looking at these two types of problems that we'll encounter, just explaining in more detail how to recognize the types. Once again, zero initial velocity is when the object begins accelerating from rest. That means its initial velocity is going to be zero. For non-zero, the object's not at rest. It's already in motion. The initial velocity then is not going to be zero. So you'll notice the difference between these two equations. I said on the previous slide that they looked very similar. We'll notice the only difference is the presence for the non-zero initial velocity equations of this v sub i. And that v sub i is the initial velocity. It's not present in the zero initial velocity equations because v sub i is just equal to zero. So we can ignore it and take it out of the equation, thus simplifying the equations for zero initial velocity. So let's look at some practice problems. Now we're going to be working these problems through in class, step by step, but I wanted to just introduce a few so that we can start to learn how to pick out the parts from the word problem. So in this particular problem, it says you get in a parked car and you accelerate to 35 miles per hour in 4.2 seconds. Calculate the rate of acceleration and the distance covered. So you first want to read the problem. And remember our first step was convert if necessary. So looking at the two pieces of information, we have 35 miles per hour and we have 4.2 seconds. So it's important to know if those are in the correct units or not. Well, 35 miles per hour, that's going to be a velocity. And on the previous slide, we said that we want velocity in meters per second. So you are going to need to convert that 35 miles per hour to a metric value. And you are actually given a conversion factor that gets you there directly. And that is one mile per hour is equal to 0.447 meters per second. Our other known, the 4.2 seconds, is already in the units we want it in. So we will leave that guy alone. Next, we want to make sure to assign symbols for all the quantities known. So to assign the symbols, we said 35 miles per hour was a velocity. So once we convert it, we will label that with the letter V. The 4.2 seconds is a time, so we will say t is equal to 4.2 seconds. We also want to label the unknown. So the unknown is what the question is asking you to solve for. In this case, it's asking us to solve for acceleration and distance. So that means we need to figure out what a is equal to and what d is equal to. Next, we need to pick an equation to solve. Well, in order to pick an equation, it's helpful to know what type of problem we're looking at. Are we looking at a zero initial velocity problem or a non-zero initial velocity problem? So looking at clues in the question itself, it's going to help us figure that out. So looking a little closer, I notice that we have a parked car. So the car was initially parked, meaning it was initially at rest meaning that its initial velocity was equal to zero. So that means that we're using the zero initial velocity equations to solve. So then we will scan through the equations, find equations that have the variables that we listed in them, and solve. For instance, to solve for acceleration, well, we have the velocity once we convert it into meters per second. We also have the time. So we would plug those two values into this equation and solve. 
Once we have the acceleration, we can then solve for distance by plugging in that acceleration we just calculated into this equation and taking the time, 4.2 seconds, and squaring it. Here's another problem we'll work through. A stomp rocket boasts it can reach an altitude of 200 feet in 3.2 seconds. Calculate its acceleration. So I'll have you look at this one on your own, but some people um, didn't know what a stomp rocket was, so I did just want to touch on that. Um, it's a kid's toy where you have a foam rocket on a launcher and you stomp on a pump. And when you stomp on that pump, it has air go through the tube and launch the rocket up in the air. So that stomp rocket boasts that it can shoot those rockets 200 feet in the air, which in my experience it cannot. <laughs> but um, you'll want to approach this like a, the other word problem, convert if necessary, assign symbols to your known and unknown values, pick an equation based off the type of problem it is, zero initial velocity or non-zero initial velocity, and then solve for the problem. So if you'd like to work through any of these on your own before watching them um, be completed on the in-class video, go ahead and pause, write them down, um, and give them an attempt. Here's just a list of non-zero initial velocity equations because the problem on the previous slide was our first non-zero that we will see, where we have an initial velocity. All right, so I want to touch for a minute on this problem. We also will be doing this one in class, but I wanted to talk about it a little bit because this is actually a problem from a real world situation. So Colonel Staff actually did um, some studies where he was trying to improve the harnesses on fighter jets. So he did some experiments using a sled that would travel at different velocities. What he was trying to test is how fast could the human body accelerate or decelerate without dying, without causing fatal damage? So he ran these tests to see, okay, if I can make a harness in a fighter jet to stop the person, to allow them to eject from the fighter jet, is it going to help at all? Or is the fighter jet going to be accelerating so fast? Is the person going to be decelerating so fast that their bodily functions are going to stop, that their blood vessels are going to rupture? So he wanted to see what the human limit of deceleration was. How fast can you slow down? So the highest velocity that was reached was actually 283 meters per second, which is very fast. We can even convert it to miles per hour in class if you want to see just how fast that is. Now he discovered that you could survive at decelerating at that velocity. So when he did this, however, there was some damage, and he was the one that did the experiment, he was the one in the sled itself that was decelerating at a very high rate. And he had blood vessels in his eyes had popped, um, lost motion in his legs for a while. He went blind temporarily. So there was a lot of damage to his body, but the fact was that he survived. So this allowed the opportunity for those fighter jets to have those ejectable seats, for them to have the harnesses. Um, and those extra safety measures giving them a chance. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate how many units of G. So units of G is actually a way that we now um, calculate deceleration and acceleration in regards to uh, lots of different things, actually. For instance, if you go to a theme park and you like roller coasters and the roller coaster speeds up really fast or slows down really fast, they can actually tell you um, the danger of the roller coaster based off of its units of G because every roller coaster has a certain amount of units of G. 
So most roller coasters are only two or three units of G. So I think you'll be a bit surprised when you see just how many units of G um, were used in this experiment here. And to end, we'll just show a picture of Colonel John Stapp when he was riding that rocket sled in those experiments in 1954. You can see it's a bit more intense than any roller coaster you've ever been on. So the Greek theory on gravity um, was they termed... Next we're going to look at the Greek theory on gravity. Now natural philosophy was what physics was called at the time, and they postulated that heavy objects actually fell faster than lighter objects. Now they believed this because at this time they thought that the Earth was the center of everything, and all other planets and the sun orbited around Earth. Okay, so they figured that Earth was the natural resting place of these objects and that heavier ones, heavier objects would fall faster than lighter ones. Galileo later disproved these theories some 1900 years later. So let's look at Galileo's law of free fall. So, Galileo figured out the rate of gravity. At the time, he didn't know or coin it as being gravity. He just did the calculations to figure out the rate. Some people believe that he went to the top of the leaning power of Pisa and took two balls of different sizes, different masses, and dropped them and observed them falling and hitting the ground at the same time. Okay, now this is possible because he did work and live in Italy at the time. Um, but as we know, since Galileo is the father of the scientific method, he wouldn't do that and then just conclude something, right? He would come up with a series of experiments. He would test those experiments. He would analyze the data. He'd go through all the steps of the scientific method to turn this hypothesis that all objects fall at the same rate into a theory. Okay, so that is what he did. He took ramps, he did some experiments, and realized that it does not matter the mass or the size of the object. All objects will fall at the same rate due to gravity. Now that rate is 9.8 meters per second squared. So he figured out that number, that 9.8 meters per second squared. He just didn't yet know that it was gravity, that it was a force pulling the objects to ground. Newton later discovered that, and we'll talk about that in chapter five. Now remember, these conditions are all given no air resistance. Okay, so we're talking in a bubble, perfect world, right? So if you're dropping a piece of paper, that's gonna have a lot more air resistance, so it's not gonna fall at the same rate as a lead ball because of the air resistance. So without air resistance, all objects fall at the same rate, 9.8 meters per second squared. So we're going to use this value, 9.8 meters per second squared, in our free fall equations. So Galileo, doing all of his experiments, collecting all his data, came up with this rate, figuring out that the rate of gravity is the 9.8 meters per second squared. Now notice the units on the gravity, meters per second squared. Okay, this looks very similar to the units on another variable that we've already looked at and that is acceleration. So when we've been calculating our zero initial velocity and non-zero initial velocity equations, the units for acceleration have been meters per second squared. So since gravity has the same units, when we approach a free fall problem, we can take all of our zero initial velocity equations like the two shown below here, and notice we have put a G in place of where the A's were. Okay, so part of your job is gonna be figuring out by reading the word problem that it is a free fall problem and that you can replace all of your A's, all your accelerations for G, gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, some clues to figure out if it's free fall would be something falling off of a ledge or off the end of a table, um, 
or off a diving board, okay? So all, any type of fall where gravity is affecting the rate of that object falling. So here are some free fall examples. Um, I will be doing these examples um, on a whiteboard and posting a video. So if you want, uh, you can stop the PowerPoint uh, and then look for that video. Projectile motion. So with projectile motion, this is also um, Galileo's did a lot of work on projectile motion. Uh, we are not going to be doing calculations with it. We just need to know some of the characteristics. Okay, so when I'm talking about projectile motion, it's the motion of an object along a trajectory. Okay, so if thinking about it, it is punting a football or shooting an arrow or a cannon. Okay, something similar to that. So with projectile motion, it almost looks sort of like a parabola. So that's the shape, that's the trajectory that the object follows. Okay. Now, projectile motion combines both horizontal motion and downward vertical motion. Galileo defined the critical concept of projectile motion, and that is that it is simultaneously horizontal and vertical. So in this diagram here, we have an example of projectile motion. We have a cannon shooting a cannonball out. Notice we have three different paths. We have A, the blue path, B, the red path, and C, the green path. Okay, so what A is, A is showing that vertical motion. So if we were to have dropped that cannonball instead of shooting it, gravity would be the only thing affecting it vertically, and it would fall straight down following this A path. The C path going straight forward in green here, okay, that would be if there was no gravity. So that's that horizontal motion of the projectile. So if there was no gravity, that cannon, once it shot, would continue going forward forever because there would be nothing to pull it down to earth. So B in red is the projectile motion path. So it's along a trajectory. Notice it looks like half of a parabola here. So what B is, the projectile motion, is it's the combination of A, the vertical, where gravity is affecting it, and C, the horizontal. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if you were to drop that cannonball and shoot a cannonball at the same exact time from the same height, they would hit the ground at the same time. Okay. This is because gravity is the only thing affecting both of those objects. Even though the object that you throw is going further than the object you drop, gravity is the only thing pulling both those objects down to Earth. So they will hit at the same time regardless of the extra distance of the thrown object. Some characteristics of projectile motion. So I just said gravity is the only force acting upon the object. That's why if you drop an object and throw an object from the same height, they will land at the same time. Okay, the object travels in a parabola. So in this diagram below, you can see the full parabola a little bit better. It possesses a launch angle and an apex. So I would remember those two things. For the apex, what that is, it's the highest point of the trajectory. So as this person is being shot out of the cannon, okay, their velocity is increasing as they go up, right? So velocity is increasing, increasing, increasing. When they hit the apex, that's when their vertical velocity is going to be zero. So they're almost suspended in air for a second. They're not moving up any further and they haven't started moving down yet. So that's what the apex is. Okay, so this person 
going up, up, up. Gravity is slowing them down. And then once they get hit the apex, their velocity is zero. And then gravity is going to start increasing their acceleration back down to Earth until they hit the ground. Or ho hopefully not the ground. Uh, hopefully that nice little net there. All right, so characteristics of projectile motion. Remember that there are no horizontal forces acting on the object except for the initial force of shooting that object or throwing that object or punting that object if you're talking about a football. Okay, so the x direction, the velocity is going to remain constant. What isn't going to remain constant is the vertical velocity. And the vertical velocity is going to increase and decrease because of gravity. Gravity pulling that object back down to the ground. So this is showing that both the horizontal and the vertical motion of a projectile are independent of each other. All right, now let's look at vectors. So I'm just gonna go over a few characteristics of vectors. They're gonna be a little bit easier to explain by doing some practice problems. So I'll be posting a video um, of me working through some of those problems on a whiteboard. Uh, but for now, let's look at the characteristics. Okay, so remember a vector is um, has both magnitude and a direction. Okay, so you'll notice they're represented by arrows here. When we talk about vector problems, we have the y-axis up here being the northerly direction and we have the x-axis down here in blue being the easterly direction okay we also have a theta symbol and what this is representing is the direction the angle which the object moved all right and then last but not least we have the vector itself, which is going to be represented by the letter A. Okay, so we have Y in the north, X in the east, the angle theta to give us the direction, and then the vector itself is represented by the letter A. So these are the equations on the equation sheet that you will be using to solve vector problems. Now, one thing I want to point out is that whenever we're solving vector problems, it's always going to be two things you're solving for. Okay, you're either going to have to solve for x and y, or you're going to solve for a and theta. All right, so you're basically given two of the four variables and you solve for the other two. Okay, your job is to figure out what variables you have been given in the word problem itself. All right, so that's the tricky part here. All right, I also do wanna point out, um, so we're using cosine and sine here. So you wanna make sure, and tangent as well, that your calculator is in degrees, not radians. So when I'm working through some of these problems, if you're getting, consistently getting the wrong answer, it could be as simple as going in to your, looking at your mode of your calculator uh, and just simply changing it from radians to degrees. All right, so when you're reading these word problems, you have to figure out what are they giving me? Are they giving me the X? Are they giving me the Y? Are they giving me the theta? Are they giving me the A? Okay, so in order to do that, here's some terms that are used in vector problems that might help you figure that out. So if the word horizontal or east is used, that's going to be the X direction. So that'll be your X in the equations shown on the previous slide. If the word vertical or north is used, that's going to be the Y. The word direction is used. So they said, OK, what direction did they go? What they're asking you is what's theta? So they want you to solve for theta if they're saying what direction. These two are a little less important. North of east means start at the exit and move your vector counterclockwise. So what I mean by that is if they say north of east, they're giving you this angle here, which is our theta. Okay. 
East of North, you probably won't see very much in this class, but if it, they say East of North, that means they're giving you this angle up here, which is not going to be helpful to us. All right. Last but not least, Northeast means equally North and East. Okay, so if they, you're reading a word problem and they use the word Northeast, they just gave you your theta. And your theta, if they say Northeast, is 45. Because what Northeast means is equally North and equally East. And if this is a 90 degree angle, and we cut that 90 degree angle in half, 90 divided by two gives us 45. Okay, and I'll work through one of the problems on the video um, to show you how to identify that. So here's just one of the vector problems, um, which I will go over on the video. I do want to point out, which you will probably like, is that you don't have to convert in these problems. So what I mean by that, in this particular question, a runner jogs 5.7 miles, right? Usually that's a, oh wait, I need to convert it to meters. Vector problems are the only physics problems that we will do where you don't have to convert. So if it's in miles in the question, you leave it in miles and you just have your answer, report your answer in miles as well. So you don't have to com um, convert back and forth. All right, well, stay tuned for the video. Let me know if you have any questions.